Okay. Great. So if you're just joining us, please let us know who you are and what organization you're with. Um, and let's go, let's get started. We are here tonight to welcome you to a really important webinar um, and one that has not been done widely on this topic, unless I'm wrong, you two can correct me, but it's maybe the most important subject of our time. And I'm really honored to welcome our speakers tonight because they are leaders in this space. Uh, tonight we have Catherine Shinar, who is the Executive Vice President for the Association for Animal Welfare Advancement, and Shelley Moore, the President and CEO of the Humane Society of Charlotte in North Carolina. And uh, these, I wanted to introduce them tonight because uh, at the beginning of COVID, Catherine and I got a chance to know each other really well in the midst of an absolute crisis moment in animal welfare. And I watched her build an incredible coalition of leaders in a, a remarkably short amount of time. And it was really life-changing lesson for me uh, because we had to move together and we had to move quickly. And so she's been a mentor of mine since then. Um, and so I'm particularly excited um, to, to hear about all of her experience. And, uh, and Shelley Moore needs no introduction, leads a fabulous organization um, and is, a, is such a leader in this space as well. So I wanna welcome both of you tonight and thank you so much for presenting this Human Animal Support Services webcast. Well, thank you, Kristen, and thank you everyone for taking time out of the busiest season of the year to spend your evening and early afternoon with us. Shelly's on the East Coast, I'm on the West Coast. I literally feel that I'm like five feet away from the North Pole. I'm visiting my in-laws in the Pacific Northwest for the holidays, and it starts to get dark at 3.30. So if I start to get really dark, just... You know, don't get too concerned. I'll try to find some light. But I, Shelly and I have been longtime friends, and we originally met at uh, Hurricane Katrina. We were first responders, and we bonded during that incredible crisis moment in our country's history. And we just have never separated <laughs> since then. And so we've got a lot of great stories and experiences to share with you. And we're really honored uh, to be asked to share that with you here through the Human Animal Support Services webinar, coming together to accomplish more, Coalition Building for Animal Care Organizations. And so we're gonna start off with just a little bit about us and then jump right in. <clears throat> As Kristen already mentioned, I'm the Executive Vice President for Animal Welfare, the Association for Animal Welfare Advancement, sorry. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are your professional association. We're the association comprised of individuals who are either leaders or aspiring leaders working as animal welfare professionals. And we focus on things like professional development. We host two conferences a year, and we really try to provide the resources and information that you need to be successful in your jobs working in an animal shelter or an animal welfare organization. And Shelly is um, one of our board members on our board as well, so she can sort of speak to that. But I've been working in animal welfare for 26 years now, and I, it flew by so quickly, I can't even believe it. But I cannot imagine doing anything other than this purpose-driven work. It has been a mission of love, and I have enjoyed every moment of it, even when animal welfare can be fatiguing and stressful and heartbreaking, it still is, I can't imagine anything better than um, working as a professional in this space. So I'd like to toss it over to Shelly and Shelly share a little bit about your background. Sure, thank you, Catherine. Um, well, as Kristen mentioned earlier, I am currently the present CEO of the Humane Society Charlotte in North Carolina. I've been in that role now 11 years and have worked in animal welfare for 36. I started back in 1985 with a government agency where I worked for 10 years and then went to the nonprofit side. So I've seen um, both aspects of 
the the business model and sheltering and uh we certainly have come a long way in the 36 years since i started one of the other roles that i've played over the past 15 years is that i was a founding member of the north carolina animal federation and i was really happy when catherine invited me to do this with her today because she was instrumental in helping us form that coalition or that federation it started as a coalition back in 2006. So um, you can go to the next slide, Catherine. Thank you. There we go. There, uh, there's a wonderful photo and our logo here. And what I'm gonna do this evening, just take a few minutes and share with you how we went about uh, the formation of a statewide coalition in North Carolina. And uh, it was an interesting process and Catherine helped lead us through that. So just a little bit of history, we can go to the next slide. In 2006, there was, a, was an effort to form a statewide coalition in North Carolina. And this uh, coalition would consist of North Carolina animal welfare professionals. Um, one of the big drivers in that was there had recently um, been some, some efforts at the, the state legislative effort level to get some pretty instrumental bills passed in um, that would impact our work in animal welfare. And it failed. Several of those bills failed. And the feedback that came back to the national organizations that were advocates for those bills to be passed was that there was not a unified voice. There were so many different mixed messages coming from so many segmented um, groups in the state that they couldn't sort it out. So um, we, we worked with the Humane Society of the United States to try to form a coalition in the state really to have that unified voice, um, primarily driven out of that legislative effort. So originally we had representation from the Western part, the Piedmont, Charlotte and Raleigh, Durham um, areas. I believe we had six or seven founding people that were involved in a small working group to put this together. Um, the original founders then worked with a consultant and that happened to be the one and only Catherine Shinar. Um, and she helped form, she had helped form other state federations, other regional um, coalitions, and had, I believe at the time, was working part-time as a consultant with the Humane Society of the United States. So this was a great opportunity for our state. Um, you know, the, obviously there was uh, an agenda behind it. We wanted to have that stronger voice in the legislature and the Humane Society of the United States wanted us to. Um, so they were very supportive in those starting efforts. So um, this, whoops, we lost this, the slide. I forgot that uh, she was sharing her, she lost uh, audio. So she will be back on in one. Second. Okay. Okay. Well, I can keep talking. You just can't <laughs> see, but we'll catch up. <laughs> okay, perfect. So um, the original founders of that working group worked with Catherine and she did some surveying of those members to find out really what the focus of this uh, collaboration this coalition effort should be. And uh, once the slides back up, you'll be able to see that. But during that survey and stakeholder research, the group identified four different goal areas that we were going to come together to address. Um, legislation was by far the biggest, 77% of the people interviewed said that was really what the focus of the coalition needed to be. Um, the second was professional training. Our state is so diverse in um, geography and also uh, more rural areas with not as many resources as the larger cities. And there really was um, a lack of training at the state level. Um, professional networking. We wanted to make sure that we were all talking to each other in the state, sharing ideas, supporting each other, um, looking at best practices. And it was a great opportunity for that group to be able to do that. And then we also wanted to establish the Federation as 
the go-to people in the state for legislators and see have the Federation seen as the experts in the industry. So that was very important to us too. She's back. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you share your screen again? Yeah. <laughs> Of course, this happens during our webinar, Shelley. Uh huh. <laughs> it's just, you're so lucky. <laughs> All right. Well, as soon as Catherine gets that back up, we will go to the next slide. So, Catherine, we were on the history slide. That one, you want to go to the next slide? Uh, hold right there for a second. You can see there at the bottom where I just went over that with those four focus areas that the stakeholder research um, came back up. So there are a couple of things that we wanted to make sure when we were forming this, um, forming NCAF that we were very cognizant of. And we wanted diversity. We did not want just this group to consist of just nonprofit animal welfare groups or just public or government animal welfare groups. We wanted um, sector representation from both. I mean, ideally, we strive to have balance, um, but you know, sometimes that just doesn't work out. But we are very cognizant of that in our recruiting, current recruiting, and when we formed, that was the focus. We also wanted this to be a member run organization. And when I say that, we didn't want to have outside influence or seen as having outside influence by national organizations because we felt like that would, we would have to take on those agendas. So initially um, it was just for North Carolina animal welfare organizations in the state. Now, this has since changed, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end and why we did that. But initially, it was very important for us to, to unify as professionals in the state to form this group. And then we talked a lot about mission and pur purpose. And as you all know, without focus in your groups, whether it's your organization or a coalition that you build, that you can just... Uh, go down a path and many paths and um, it's hard to like reel that in when you have so many differing perspectives in a group. So we, we didn't want it to compete with any other organizations. There is a North Carolina um, Animal Control Association and we did not want to compete with them. We also didn't want to be doing the same work that they were doing. We wanted to be able to complement them. So we were making sure that all areas were covered in the state. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that it wasn't too broad, like I mentioned earlier. And we narrowed it down to focus primarily on companion animal issues. We did not want to get into livestock or wild animals or exotic animals unless it particular it pertained to the work that we were actually doing, but we really were focused on companion animals. Next, Catherine. So once we've got all that foundation in place, we knew what we wanted our purpose to, to be, we decided that we were gonna formalize our coalition. Not all coalitions formalize, and I'm sure Catherine will talk about that a little later. You can be a coalition and be loosely together and just have a set meeting and come together with a common purpose, or you could do what we did and we ended up becoming our own 501c3. So we came up with our name, our official name. Um, we were formed in November of 2006. We have bylaws and of course we came up with our mission which you can see here on the slide. And then once we had all that foundation in place, the next thing we did was we opened it up to membership for people to become members. And initially when we were doing all this formation work, like I said earlier, it was a very small working group. Um, I think it would have gotten too out of control if we started with all, you know, a huge membership trying to formalize this. Um, once we felt really comfortable with where we were, that's when we started to say, okay, let's open membership up, let's take members in. So now today, where are we? Next slide. 
we have two classes of membership, um, both associate and organization. It took a while for us to get to that. Associate, associates are individuals. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why people join as individuals, but the majority of our members are organizational members. And as an organizational member, they get um, three, representatives, three representatives from their organization that can serve on committees, be eligible for the board, and then anybody in their organization gets a discount a membership discount to our professional development offerings. So that was the benefit of the organizational membership. Um, now our members have expanded, not just to private sheltered. Oh, that's one thing I didn't mention either, that in order to be eligible initially, you had to be working out of a bricks and mortar shelter. You couldn't be a volunteer with paid staff and you couldn't be a volunteer based organization or a foster based organization. That changed later, and now our membership can include, um, we decided to allow high volume, high quality spay and neuter organizations for membership. And also we changed how we approached uh, national organizations, because as <clears throat> all of you know, people with remote work, and this has been even before COVID for national organizations, people live in different states. So if you were living in North Carolina, but working, for example, for the ASPCA or working for Best Friends or working for the Humane Society of the United States, and you lived in the state and the work impacted the state, then you were eligible for an associate membership. Um, so that, that has been great too. Um, and we did decide to change that because we felt like we were um, together and uh, gelled enough that we could bring it in where we would not lose our focus, purpose, or agenda. So currently we have over 157 representatives from 57 different organizations in 39 counties. So we're still, our goal is to be, to have representation from every county and there's a hundred in North Carolina. So we're still not anywhere near where we'd like to be, but we do have all the major communities in the state um, that have really active organizations as part of the Federation. Um, we've increased our legislative participation. We have our own legislative agenda. Um, legislators now turn to us for opinions, which has been great. Um, and we also do a lot of professional development offerings. Um, and you can see on the right there, there's a list of some of the things that we provide. Um, and we also do an annual conference jointly with the State of South Carolina's Association, and that is called Carolinas Unite. Um, and I, Kristen was just talking, she'll be a speaker there. Catherine will be there um, next year too. So here's a membership map. This is not currently, it's a couple years, I think, um, old, but you can see the, the ones that are colored in blue, uh, municipal ones are the lighter blue, uh, the darker blue are private organizations. And then the ones with gray are awesome because we have both private and public from those counties um, as members of the Federation. And then lastly, just a big old plug for our conference. The next uh, slide. There we go, isn't that pretty? And it's lots of fun. Um, it's a smaller conference. We have anywhere from like 100 and 120 to 170 people attend, but we provide really good quality workshops. And this has been um, something that has really kind of um, provide a lot of momentum and focus for the Federation. So I think, are we on to the next? All right. So that was just a little uh, background on my experience with a successful setting up a successful coalition. Um, but overall, you know, coalitions can play a vital role in our work. Um, the bottom line is that none of us can do this alone. So by having a group of people, you can have a bigger impact. Um, having diverse perspectives can lead to creativity a stronger group with greater outcomes. Okay, next. But don't worry, 
You don't have to do it alone. Um, there is a great book. This was kind of the, the Bible for us starting up our coalition and um, Catherine is the author. Um, and it's also available on amazon.com. And next Catherine. So the book covers the basics of coalition building and it also is a step-by-step -step guide with tools that you can actually apply to your efforts um, in putting a group together. Um, it starts with some really basic background info about coalitions in general, which I'll share with you some of the highlights. Um, so you can see here um, what the definition of a coalition and now the purpose, and like I mentioned earlier, the sum of having everybody together can create bigger outcomes and better outcomes um, than just individuals trying to accomplish something. So let's talk about the benefits. Um, strength and power numbers, credibility. Um, you can garner media attention. That's been one thing we've been able to do is get press releases out that go statewide about our work. Um, increased access to policymakers. That was really, really our number one driver in this group. Networking opportunities. I tell you, I've met so many people across the state and we've created transfer networks out of being part of the Federation um, and made some great friends. So it really is a good way to um, connect with people in your state. And then of course, economies of scale. Now there's, next slide, there are some disadvantages to consider. Um, you've got potential for negative conflict when you have very different um, perspectives coming to the table. That's also a plus, but it can also be a con. A con. Um, it's really important to establish those ground rules up front. Catherine was very helpful with that. I know there's a big part of that in the book, but that was really critical for us. Um, and it takes a while for you to gel as a group and to build that trust. So, you know, there is a time investment before you can start to really see, you know, the positive outcomes from, from your work. And um, you sometimes you do have trouble selling, um, like if you work for a board of directors or work for the government, selling your time. Um, or the value of your time to participate in these. And there is some administrative time required for coalitions. So I think the advantages totally outweigh the disadvantages. Um, and I gave you an example of success with NCAF. Um, we, like I mentioned, we were founded in 2006, so we've been active for 15 years. and. Um, you know, I've been involved in coalitions that have also failed. So why do some succeed and why do some fail? Well, successful coalitions have strong leadership. That's really critical. Obviously, um, focusing on your common interests and not your differences. Um, all participants having a voice at the tables, critical. Celebrate your successes. They're gonna start small. They may be small down the road, but celebrate them and you'll continue to have them and just keeping everybody active and involved. I know that's been a challenge for us during COVID because we can't see each other in person. And um, you know we're all running our organizations in very challenging times. On the flip side, next, what makes a coalition fail? Well, lack of leadership and structure. And if you can, if you can follow that kind of uh, blueprint for putting a group together, you can get the structure that you need to be successful. People will get bored. Some people will get bored um, or they're not uh, celebrating those successes to keep motivated. And again, focusing on those differences instead of the common interest. So critical, just put them aside. You know, I, I used to say to everybody, you know, if you enter this room, you got to check your ego at the door. It's just, we got to do it to, to, you know, create the greater good. So leadership is so key um, as it is in all of our organizations. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine who's gonna take you through some of the elements of the book. Catherine. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Shelly. I um, just wanna make sure everybody can hear me okay. And Shelly, can you hear me? 
you can't. All right, great. There's nothing more exciting than doing a webinar and having complete technical difficulties. But we will soldier through this. Um, one of my favorite books, many of you have probably already read this book. It's the very, very famous Jim Collins, Good to Great. And that book has a uh, accompanying piece that is called uh, Good to Great in the Social Sectors. And one of the takeaways from that book that just has always stayed with me is that true leadership only exists if people follow when they have the freedom not to. And you think about that and you realize that um, you have people who are charismatic and they're great leaders. Um, and you have people who are in positions of executive power who aren't able to you know, pull the group together. So leadership is pretty critical in that you really need to have people who are willing to put in that level of work and to employ leadership skills to do it. So when you're looking for leaders to sit at that coalition table, you want to you know, really look for folks who are you know, they're competent, impartial, they're respected, or they're influential. Um, and whoever you're going to assign as your leader to coalition, you really need that person to be respected by everyone sitting at that table. And this is just a quick explanation of executive versus legislative leadership. And I think we're all familiar with this, but just as a refresher, executive leaders can use power to implement decisions. I'm the boss, so you have to do this because I'm the boss. Um, legislative leaders have to use persuasion and influence to implement decisions. And so they have to bring their people along. And that's the kind of leader that really needs to lead your coalition. There are of course gonna be challenges as with any initiative. Um, the leader needs to stay focused on the group, on the similarities shared by the group and not the philosophical differences. This is super important because if that happens, then it sort of begins this downward spiral that you just can't get past. You know, once that spiral gets started, it's really difficult, if not impossible, you know, to reverse it. So you need to definitely have a plan. You need to be able to catch the attention of the coalition members. You need to hold their interests. You need to be able to bring them back to the table and create a winning team. And so what that means is, when people aren't participating the way that you would like them to, you need to reach out to them individually and say, hey, we missed you at the last meeting. You weren't there and your voice is really important. You know, we really want to know what your thoughts are and we hope we'll see you at the next meeting. Um, it's those little things that really kind of keep things going in the background. So there's a couple of stages to getting started. And as Shelly mentioned earlier, there are uh, formal coalitions and then there are more informal. And either way, they all sort of have the same structure. So getting started at first, everybody's super excited that everybody's you know, interested in what it might uh, entail. They are perhaps a little apprehensive as well. And most of all, they're basically sitting there thinking, well, what's in this for me? You know, what, how is my organization going to benefit? And so some of the questions that you can ask yourself in your first coalition meeting is, you know, what is our mission? You know, what, why are we coming together? And what are those shared interests that we have? And then what resources do we have to drive this work? And so a really common example is uh, looking at legislation. So if your coalition is looking at a local municipal ordinance change or a statewide legislative initiative. This is a great example of, you know, we know that our goal and our mission is to get this legislation passed and that our shared interests, regardless of our philosophy or background or how we feel about certain items and animal welfare, it doesn't really matter. We're all decided that this is the right way to go for this legislative work. And then, you know, what are the resources that we need to get there? And everybody can contribute in different ways. So those are the basic questions that you really need to focus on. And then Shelly mentioned that there's a structure. So, and this is a much more formalized process. You don't have to be this formal, but I find that when people just like employees, just like volunteers, 
having a job description really helps in terms of setting expectations and you know, people want to know that they're contributing. And so if they have a very specific role in the coalition, it really gives them a sense of ownership of the work. So obviously you would like to identify a leader, um, also a facilitator who is not the same as a leader. A facilitator is the person that keeps the conversation going, makes sure that the agenda is being followed, that we stay on track for the type of work that we need to be doing. You want a recorder, somebody, they're not taking in-depth meeting minutes. They're, they're just sort of recording the highlights just to kind of make sure everybody's on the same page and we can, if somebody misses the meeting, they know what's happened. Um, a timekeeper is important because there's nothing worse than getting started in a meeting and then you run out of time and people get frustrated. And then obviously the people that are participating, the people at the table who are contributing to the conversation um, and then from time to time, depending on what topics you're exploring, it might be beneficial to bring on a resource attendee. And that would be somebody who maybe is a special in a certain area or can, can bring a very professional point of view um, for the whole coalition to learn about a topic. So that is something that you can employ as you go along. But if your folks who are in your coalition, if they know what their role is, they're gonna be a lot more successful in what they're trying to do. Shelly, I already mentioned earlier the importance of ground rules, and I cannot stress enough how important these are to the success of any coalition. And it's, it's again, it's about managing expectations and making expectations very clear from the very beginning. So there isn't amb any ambiguity. There isn't any uh, misunderstanding of what's permissible and what's not. And it doesn't have to be, you know, an intense list, but it should outline, you know, what's most important. So this is an example of uh, some ground rules that I think are helpful. So one of the ground rules is, you know, attend all meetings on a regular basis to make sure there's continuity in the relationship building and communication. Um, keep coalition matters confidential. Communicate with respect, fairness, and honesty. Never speak on behalf of the group unless designated by the coalition. It's also important to establish a conflict management procedure so that when something does happen, that's um, a challenge for the group that you have a procedure to follow so that you can you know, use that as a tool to get through. Um, and then meeting protocols, you know, setting up the agenda, sticking to it, you know, um, really making sure that you respect everybody's time, not um, engaging in sidebar conversations or disruptive behavior. And again, these ground rules seem very obvious, but I think by actually vocalizing them and having everybody adhere to them and agree that these are the ground rules, I think you get a lot better buy-in and success. Shelly mentioned already with her history of the North Carolina Animal Federation that you definitely need to figure out what your purpose is and what your mission is. And it doesn't, everybody doesn't have to do it together. You can break out into smaller groups and identify you know, some ideas of what might work. And the um, once those are established, you can uh, break out with the different groups and kind of take a stab at writing a mission statement. And this is a really great opportunity for different people who don't know each other to work together. This is a great exercise where they can sort of start to develop a rapport. And that is very helpful as you continue to build that trust and develop those communication, opening those doors of communication that may not have been there before. So once the groups have sort of come back together and really everyone's identified what they think makes a lot of sense for your purpose and mission, then think about some of the planning and the considerations that you have there. So you definitely need to to carve out time to do this. This is not something that you can just put on your to-do list and get to it when you want to. It is involving other people, other people's um, time. And so you have to be mindful of their schedules and you need to be really focused and committed to doing this work 
within the time that you've allotted. Again, wait until the last minute to do something or just trying to get it done um, as you can fill it in. It just isn't going to make this a very fulfilling experience for you or for any of the participants. Uh, some, sometimes, you know, you're going to need some money or very specific skill sets to um, make things work in the coalition. For example, if you are going to pursue media relations and you want to get um, the press involved with the work you're doing, definitely making sure that you have somebody who can be that media relations point person and communicate with the media. You um, probably also want to assign some responsibility to, to somebody who's going to um, spearhead the planning committee or whatever sort of discussion or consensus that you really need to work on. And the reason why planning is so important, and I, I doubt that I need to reiterate this to all of you, but you know, you having a plan gives you that roadmap for success. You um, at the very minimum, as you begin planning, you should already have what your common ground is, you know, what are the reasons that you all come together. You should have received commitment from all the participants that these are the ground rules, these are uh, the conflict resolution uh, protocols, and this is our mission. So once you have those three very basic elements, then you can really roll up your sleeves and start planning. And so planning is pretty much what you would expect in terms of, you know, needing to identify the resources that you need to accomplish the goal. It's probably going to be money, time, goodwill, building support. Um, and this is a great opportunity to create action committees that can make plans or recommendations and come together and share that with a larger group. When you're in this process, especially at the beginning, it's, you know, people are really excited when they first start, but then because you know they have a regular job and they have a busy life and then they miss a meeting or something if if members don't see some progress fairly early on they're going to not necessarily see the value in what you're doing so take your time do the things in the the right way but also make sure that you can show some progress in a way that, that everyone can recognize that you are moving forward in, in this path. So your plan, as you're continuing to work on your plan, should detail the strategies and resources that you need to meet the goals, and definitely look at short and long-term plans as um, what you need to outline. And then the final component of the plan really should be the outcomes as measurements. So once you've worked this plan, and once you know this is what you want to do as a coalition, what do the outcomes look like and how are you going to measure them? And I think many of us are familiar with SMART goals. And so I'm just reiterating that, you know, the goal should be written down. Goals should have a, dime, a deadline. The goal should be assigned to somebody so that they know that it needs to be completed. And the goal should be measurable. And again, that's going to help clarify and clear up any misconceptions that you may have about what you're trying to do. It's also important to remember that um, for those of you who do strategic planning in your organizations, we all know that the best laid plans often go astray as the saying goes, but plans should be fluid because issues are going to arise, opportunities are going to come up, and you might want to you know, take a minute and rethink, is this the right path? So have some, have a plan that's written down, that has goals, that has deadlines, but then also be able to be agile enough to react to situations or opportunities, and then, you know, keep moving. Something that does happen in coalitions, and I have to say it's so impressive that the North Carolina Animal Federation is celebrating 15 years this year. Um, it's just an amazing testament to, you know, the participants who really pulled together to continue their success. Um, a lot of coalitions, they suffer from, you know, something that wouldn't surprise you, momentum loss. People, you know, have other responsibilities in life. And, you know, some areas where this happens is, you know, after the initial startup, people maybe get bored or they get distracted by their job. Um, 
something that is a real challenge is um, lack of continuity. So there would be a member of the coalition working at your organization, but they got a fantastic new job. And so now they've moved on to a new organization and there's a hole at that table now that needs to be filled. And so that new person doesn't have the history of the relationships, but then also, um, you know, you're losing that continuity of how you make decisions together. Um, sometimes the, the original, your home organization pulls support because they don't recognize the value of the work you're doing. And so that is something that you really have to continually impress upon your own organization that our participation in this coalition is really important to our work in this area. And if we aren't there at the table, our voice isn't being heard. And so those are continual little issues that are gonna pop up along the journey. And again, people get bored. And if, if you're not able to keep that uh, trajectory of you know, making progress and celebrating those small successes, then people will get bored and they won't participate. Some of the predictors, just so you can kind of be mindful and watch out for them are, you know, when people start to have misunderstandings or there's some sort of unethical communication or unhealthy communication, like violations of the ground rules, those um, can be really challenging. But if you have that conflict management protocol in place, then you just follow that and that will help you navigate that difficult situation. Um, and again, if people are bored, they're not going to continue to put a lot into it. So one of the things that Shelly, I think, has done a really great job with is helping um, to celebrate and evaluate what needs to happen in the coalition. So that is something where you just take the time on a routine basis. Maybe it's annually. Um, maybe it's every six months. You know, seek input from stakeholders. Are we um, still looking at the right critical issues? Have those issues changed? Should we be looking elsewhere? We grown with community expectations. You know, are we really on the on the right path for what's important in animal welfare? And then take your internal temperature frequently. You know, continue to ask yourselves: Are the goals clear? Are the meetings productive and consistent? Do you feel that your opinions are valued and do you feel connected with the other coalition members? And what are some areas for improvement? By continuing to take your internal temperature, you can really stave off some of those concerns for the coalition to stumble. So that is sort of the blueprint, if you will, of uh, coalition building for animal welfare organizations. And this is contact information for myself and for Shelly. Should you uh, wanna reach out to either one of us, we're happy to talk with you about it, share you know, real life experiences. Um, and we just wanna, again, thank you for this opportunity to, to share this story and to share this work and to talk about something that's really important. And so then we thought we would open it up to questions. If anybody has questions, we'd be happy to answer them. It looks like there's one in the um, question and answer box from Diana in New Mexico. So I don't know if everybody can see that, but the question is, I'm from New Mexico and we already have a lobbying group. We're a rural state with a few urban centers and I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do is form a coalition with the animal organizations. Problem is I cannot get the big dog, the Humane Society Animal Shelter, which is government funded um, as part of it because they see us as competition. So Diana wants to know if we have advice on how to get a disinterested party to the table in the first place. So I, I'll take a stab at it and then I'll let Catherine chime in. I think the first thing is understanding why you wanna form the coalition. Um, you know, what's your purpose? Is it to, you know, just facilitate conversation amongst the communities? Is it a transfer network? So really identifying what that coalition's purpose is and then seeing whether or not there's somebody in your group that is interested, that has a good relationship with the leader at that organization and try to get them to have a one-on-one -on -one personal conversation with them about why 
why the coalition is important, why it would be valuable, and trying to get that person to the table. And if you don't need to have them there and they don't want to play and you have, you know, a goal and a focus, I would say don't not do it. They may join later once they see the value in that group. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, Shelley. I think sometimes people like to sort of sit back and watch and, you know, they're not early adopters and so they're laggards in the process. Um, and that's okay. You, you know, focus on the people that you are able to get to the table and focus on working with them because they've already recognized the importance of being at the table. And I completely agree with what Shelley said about finding somebody who has a connection with that organization, a point of entry. And sometimes it's just going to lunch with that person and saying, hey, this is why this is important, or it's a phone call. It's just being able to have that one-on-one -on -one leader to leader conversation so that they understand the goals of what you're trying to accomplish. And also that they understand sort of the consequences of them not being there. You know, if they recognize that, you know, several of the organizations are committed to this and, you know, maybe there's a little bit of FOMO, you know, you don't want to take advantage of the fear of missing out. So I definitely think it's a personal outreach that's going to be the most successful in this space. Um, but, but be prepared in that conversation to really talk about why participation is so important so that they understand that it's it's obvious they need to be at the table. Do we have any other questions? Jamie, do we have any questions? Yeah, there's another question in the Q&A. Um, Shelly is asking, can you give some examples of specific goals and milestones to be reached? Well, I'll start and then Shelly can kind of share maybe some of NCAP's goals. Um, at the very beginning, keep your goals easy, simple, so that you can, you know, celebrate those successes. So, you know, your first couple of goals truly just might be establishing a name, establishing ground rules, figuring out what your uh, purpose and mission should be. And those are not, you know, small lifts. Those are things that take some time and discussion and collaboration to, you know, really dig in and figure it out. And so, you know, maybe your goal is within the first three months, you want to have, you know, researched, identified, and developed your mission statement. I mean, that in itself is a pretty important accomplishment. So start off with some very basic goals like that and be thoughtful about you know, are you gonna be meeting once a month? Are you gonna be meeting twice a month? Um, and just sort of put your timeline in place for those very, very basic infrastructure goals and just to kind of get you started. And then as you are able to um, get through your planning session and figure out this is what we're trying to accomplish and this is the plan of action that we need to do to, to reach our goals, then I think um, you can become after you have some success behind you, you can become um, more sophisticated in pursuing different types of goals. And so Shelly, do you wanna um, talk to some of those goals that you all pursued after you did all the infrastructure work? Yeah, I was gonna say really the, the goals are gonna be dependent, like Catherine said, on where you are in the evolution of your group. And you know, early on, you've got the, the whole infrastructure and formation goals, I think, uh, just some examples of goals, and we set them annually now, but early on, you know, that goal of having the diversity in our coalition, we wanted both representation from public and private, we were very, very adamant and strategic, um, wanting to develop relationships with legislators, having those one-on-one -on -one relationships where they would turn to us um, as the experts, those are some of the early goals. Now our goals are more toward um, like membership and having um, diverse representation throughout the entire state, trying to get more people involved. Uh, we have goals regarding to um, the types and numbers of professional development opportunities. We offer to the state um, goals around our, our conference. So they're more 
um, those harder tangible goals, the further you uh, move through the evolution of the organization. I don't know if that, that helps Shelly, but those are just some of the examples that we had. And I got a couple more questions here in the last few minutes. Um, one is from April and she asked, do you have any advice aimed at groups working internationally? The culture where our organization works is not very collaborative. In addition, there is very little understanding of best practices of how to address the overpopulation issues that drive everything else. I don't have experience with an international coalition, so I'm gonna let Catherine answer that. So I have worked internationally with some groups and I, there is no magic pill or magical solution. Again, it's, my advice is gonna be the same. Focus on that infrastructure, focus on the continuity, focus on um, shared purpose and you know, start small and grow. Um, it's very difficult to start large and then pull back. So my advice would be to start small and grow. And as you're successful, then invite more people in. Um, you know, again, I think putting that infrastructure in place is critical because you have to have the commitment to want to be in a coalition, to want to be a part of the conversation. Because if you don't have that commitment, it doesn't matter if you're philosophically aligned or not. It doesn't matter. Um, you can't really dig into those differences or those um, you know, conversations until you have the groundwork and the foundation of success. Thank you. And then Kristen um, is asking also, how do you handle it when, when, the, when the philosophy disagreements pop up? Do you allow any amount of conversation for them? I love how you focus on continuously working to find common ground. Well, and that's a great question, Kristen, because um, you know it's naive to think that that's never gonna happen. Absolutely, it happens. People get frustrated and there can be arguments or, and again, if you have those infrastructure elements in place, the ground rules, the conflict resolution tool, if you have those in place, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just fall back on them and say, you know what? I know that we may not agree on this particular point and that's okay, but what we do agree on is this, and according to our ground rules, this is what we're gonna focus on. And if you want to dig into this outside of the coalition, that's fine. But for the sake of the coalition, we need to be focused on the areas that we do agree on. And you know, I think it's natural that people wanna have a debate or they wanna talk about something. But the problem is if you let it overtake the conversation, if you let it take you off agenda, if you let it um, divert the attention of everyone, it'll really turn some people off and people you know, may not come back to the table because of it. So again, respect those ground rules, respect um, everybody's time and you know, always circle back to why are we here? We're not here to solve all the problems of the world. We're here to just focus on this particular issue. And if you can focus on that, don't be distracted by the things that make you different or think about things differently. And Shelly, do you have any real life examples of, of what you've, when you've been challenged? Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I know that we allow for respectful conversation with differing perspectives during our board meetings and during our membership meetings. I think it's up to the leader to kind of control that and bring people back in focus if it does get too, um, you know, too far away from what you're trying to accomplish. And many of you, all of you probably know Josh Fisher and he's our chair, so he's very good at that. <laughs> um, but I think it's, it's again, a strong leader to keep you focused, make sure your members, your, your, your board uh, shows leadership in this where everybody knows what those ground rules, it's a respectful conversation. We're not going to be disrespectful to each other or they're they're asked to not participate. Yeah, absolutely. 
I agree. And then and one final um, question, um, and maybe you just have some resources, other resources to point folks to. Do you have a process where you can review business plans and give feedback? So I think that's referring to just other tools that might be available or folks that they can reach out to. Oh, you mean if you have a business plan or a, a plan for your coalition? Yeah. You can, you can just send it to me in my email and I'd be happy to take a look at it. Wonderful. I think those are all the questions that we have in the chat. Um, thank you so much for this. And the recording for this will be available. Um, it'll be sent out in three business days uh, for everyone that's uh, joining us later. Well, thank you so much uh, to Human Animal Support Services, American Pets Alive, Jamie, Kristen, um, Shelly. Uh, just thrilled that we were able to talk about this topic and wish you all the very best of success and good luck with your work in your own communities. And Shelly and I are available. We've been doing this a long time and we're happy to talk with everybody. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you both so much. This is great. Thanks for having us. Have a great night. Bye, Bye y'all.